Well, then let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest and great conversation ahead. So today, let me introduce our guest. The topic of learning management systems is something of great concern in educational technology. Every college and university just about has at least one LMS or VLE. They're very important for our architecture. They're very important for how we plan digital technology and its intersection of the educational world. And the LMS world is now a very burgeoning business sector. We've had several different guests on the show before, um, including some analysts and the founder of one. And we're really, really excited to have Dan Goldsmith. Dan's the CEO of Instructure. He is a terrific, terrific, thoughtful person, someone that we've been looking forward to talking to for quite some time. And we're really excited to have him on stage. So without any further ado, let me bring Dan Goldsmith up and we can start talking. Greetings, Dan. Hey, greetings, Brian. How are you today? I'm splendid. How about yourself? Very good. Really excited to be uh, to have the opportunity to talk to so many people in this forum and uh, and also converse with you. Whenever I get a chance to talk with you, I'm super excited. I remember that first hour uh, when we met and we talked, it felt like five minutes. It went by so quickly. I jumped in right naturally to all sorts of interesting topics of the future of education. So I've been looking forward to, to this session for some time now. Well, it's very kind of you to say, and it's really, really great to see you. Um, listen, to introduce you to folks, uh, let me just ask, and we could talk about your background. Everyone on the email list has gotten uh, your, your bio and your photo. Um, but let me ask, looking ahead a little bit, for academic year 2019, 2020, what are you looking forward to? What are the big projects and uh, issues that uh, you're going to be spending most of your time on? Yeah, so it's a great question, and uh, it's very apropos at this point in time as well, where, where as many of you are, are, are deep involved with right now, it's fall yeah, start, too. which is the busiest time, I imagine, for, for all of you as well for the entire team here at Instructure. And, uh, you know, this, this year upcoming, 2019 and 2020, uh, I'm sure will not, uh, not, not uh, leave us disappointed in terms of all of the adventures uh, ahead. Um, there's a few themes that we see, you know, coming from uh, the, the organization and institutions that we work with, as well as the many varied uh, partner uh, organizations we work with from content to te technology partners as well. But I think the biggest theme for this year um, and probably moving forward in subsequent years is really about more integrated learning experiences. And cool. so while well, we've been really privileged and, and fortunate uh, as, as, as in structure with Canvas to, to play a critical supporting role in education, what we're seeing more and more demand for now is more of these integrated learning experiences. And I think they come from the communities of students and parents and, and teachers um, that are becoming much more wide and varied and connected with each other, you know, helping each other succeed. Uh, cool. We see it from broader communities of, of different organizations support, supporting the edu educational process as well as uh, professional organizations and corporations getting involved with the educational process. And so I think the biggest theme we're seeing is that interconnectivity of community and creating more communication support networks that go well beyond sort of a traditional learning management system. Wow, that's quite ambitious. Integrated yeah. learning. Yeah. Um, friends, I, I have all kinds of questions to bombard poor Dan with. Um, I'm just going to roll off with one, but let me just invite all of you to ask your questions and to make your comments. Again, please use either that question mark to type in a question or comment. In fact, two of you have just done that, even as I'm speaking. Um, or click the raised hand uh, if you'd like to join us up here on stage. Uh, in effect, we just had a question. Uh, let me just flash this on the screen as a good example of this. This is from, uh, let's see, this is Laura Geckler at University of Notre Dame. She says, integrated learning experience, give us an example. Here's an example. Good, uh, really good question. So um, integrated learning experiences, um, you know, we've seen a, a wide variety of sort of definitions or, or mm. sort of apps <coughs> around this concept. Um, but some examples are, Sort of extensions of communities to be integrated with um, um, like tutoring systems or peer advisory systems and having them be more integrated into the actual classroom experience or the curriculum that an individual student is going through. Um, in K-12, a great example is the, the, the alignment and the, the integration of assessments uh, where we're seeing more innovative assessments evolve 
beyond just sort of your benchmark informative assessments where um, assessments can happen sort of in the flow of teaching at the point of learning. So you can truly address issues and challenges and, and, and learning objectives at the point of need. Um, and then we're seeing more integrated learning experiences in collaboration with corporations. Um, so, you know, we have a number of, we work with a number of institutions that have created a relationship with biotech companies or, or engineering companies or cool. other types of professional organizations to actually bring those experiences or into the classroom and bring the classrooms or into those experiences as well. And although topics like or, or areas like co-ops and other type of uh, experience have, have always been there, we're seeing the need to have them more integrated into the curriculum and the way people learn and grow. Wow, that's quite an experience, um, and that's a, quite an ecosystem. Uh, well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so if you're new to the forum, uh, that's actually a really good example of you know, how to use a question. So I've just typed it in the question mark button, and up we run. Um, so you can do this at any time. Um, and we'll have more questions coming in uh, as we go. So one question to ask you. Oh, and by the way, friends, um, I put up a little button here on the stage. And it's got a, it looks like a podium. And it's kind of teal colored background. So if you don't want to ask me to beam you up on stage, you can just click that and up you'll go. Um, so Dan, thinking about the, the LMS right now, you know, we've been developing this with uh, quite a few different vendors, you know, vendors like uh, Blackboard. We've had open source projects like Sakai and Moodle. It's been going on since the 1990s. Um, there's been a lot of talk of a kind of quantum leap forward in the LMS with what some call the next generation digital learning environment. I'm curious, do you see the next, say, five years of the LMS? Do you think we'll keep doing incremental improvements in doing projects like you described, integrated learning? Or do you see us making a kind of quantum leap forward into this next generation? Yeah, I think there's a uh, great question. I, I, I think first and foremost, there's a symbiotic relationship, in my opinion, between the innovation and the change in the sort of educational landscape and industry and, and what education is looking to achieve. And I can talk about some of those themes as well. And then the technology that supports and enables that change. In fact, at Instructure with Canvas, our objective is to almost fade into the background. We want to be able to support mm. the teaching and the experience in a way where we are not the star player. Um, and we really want to, uh, you know, emphasize sort of the teacher and the student as the key focus in, in the educational experience. But when we talk about that next gen digital, I think there's a few, um, a few trends and changes in education that are going to drive uh, that need. Um, and there's a few broader ones, but you know, but some of the specific things is obviously more online and blended learning will drive change both in the educational experience expectations and then the technology that's required uh, to support that. And we see that in our, our daily lives every day where things are becoming more online, integrated, and sort of blended in the way that we operate. And that's more and more uh -huh. natural. Um, uh -huh. The other thing is the shift towards a much wider sort of spectrum of uh, credentials and how we measure sort of academic achievement or learning and the application of that learning. The largest growing population right now, as we all know, is the, the professional worker coming back to school. It's not your traditional sort of you know, um, college student. And that's creating a big difference in demand as well in terms of how people balance their time, how do they access learning and education. And technology, again, can be a key enabler in the digitization of, of, of technology. I also think there's going to be really two other things. We'll see, um, I think, quantum leaps and shifts in content. And we're seeing the 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 storming phase of that now um, with a proliferation of OER content. We're seeing um, content sources being developed uh, from um, organizations that we haven't seen before. Um, Amazon has an entire curriculum around cloud computing that's available to everyone. Apple has a swift uh, computing capability. We see uh, organizations like Wiley that is now sort of changing the whole paradigm of how they look at developing and delivering content that is oriented around job classes. So if you're a chemical uh, engineer or, or a law student or, um, or a, uh, a marketing professional or student, um, there's different modalities of learning that can be better applied and experiences that can 
be applied. And then, then the last thing there that I think will help with that, that, that quantum leap or, or, or seismic shift in that next gen digital model is really data and information. And that's mm-hmm. a big, big topic right now. It's a hot topic, mm-hmm. which I'm happy to talk about. But, um, but data, um, as, as organizations, uh, institutions are really looking at the key uh, imperatives regarding driving retention and graduation rates, Mm -hmm. Um, being more accountable and having more measurable outcomes and driving success through the educational uh, process and all of that being supported by continual improvement of education, data is is required to sort of inform that ecosystem at every single level. So, you know, all of those factors, I think, will create some of those quantum leaps in the coming sort of five to ten years. Well, there's a lot of major trends really pushing on the LMS. Um, yes. Your, your opening thought just reminded me of this classic phrase from uh, the great computer scientist Mark Weiser. When you mentioned Canvas kind of fading into the background, he has that beautiful phrase, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. Yeah. So 1991, you thought of this. Um, people have been, as you spoke then, people have been throwing all kinds of questions. Let me just grab one from Twitter. This is Laura Gibbs, who wanted to come in, uh, but ran to a bandwidth problem to completely understand. And she asked, I'll quickly paraphrase, can Dan say something definitive about individual data opt-out? Not institutional, but individual, so that we can opt-out from having our data included in data sets. Yeah, so that's great. So, Laura, I... I Really appreciate the question, and this has been a, a, a dialogue and question that has been raised a lot of time, not only around sort of how data is used and where ownership lies, but the opt-out of that information or the opt-in to that information as well. If you look globally, um, you know, this is a hot topic, and it varies from market to market. In fact, um, I've worked a lot in the healthcare industry prior to, to joining mm-hmm. in structure. And so dealing with HIPAA and different, you know, privacy concerns of some very sensitive, you know, individual data as well through hospital systems and pharmaceutical companies and, and clinics and other, other areas. So in the U.S. we have, you know, in general, I'm not talking about in structure, in general there's an opt-in culture, which, which people in, you know, by default are opt-in. And that's one of the unfortunate reasons why we all get sort of spam and phone, you know, phone calls on our cell phones that are unwelcome. Uh, in Europe, it's an opt-out culture. By default, you're opt-out. So, you know, not only is this a hot topic in terms of how we navigate it, but um, it's also something that really differs from market to market. Um, you know, within Structure, we really believe that that data is owned, you know, first and foremost by the individual, um, and they should have controls over sort of access and usage of that information. In fact, you know, one of the things that we are trying to enable is more sort of ownership by that individual. Now, within Structure... For the most part, we don't we don't really generate data. Um, most of what we do is really more is what's called a data uh, data um, uh, processor, if you will, not a data controller. So, you know, when we work at different institutions, different institutions have very different um, requirements and considerations around how they want data to be used and accessed. And actually, the broader topic of student data is usually sort of controlled by the institution we're working with, less so by instructor. Well, that's a very, very rich answer. You know, you've gone from the, the micro level of individual action to the macro level of major technology and economic trends. Thank you. And, and thank you, Laura, for the great question. Uh, we have a few more questions coming up. Um, and let me just pull up a couple on video. So we have uh, David Stone coming up from Penn State University. Give me a second here. There Hello, David. Hey, David. Hello. You? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I have a question. There's kind of a, been some a lot of trends in terms of inter, interinstitutional collaboration, um, shared services, partnerships. Um, students are tr- moving from institution to institution, from location to location. I'm just trying to get a, what is what is kind of the instructor's kind of thoughts or strategy about how to accommodate those kind of things because I think typically. In, uh, LMS institu- in, instances are really focused around a single institution, maybe some third party tools, yeah. or maybe a single institute information system and, and things of that nature. Yeah, so, so Dave, um, great question. And I think there's a lot that, that still needs to be defined in this area of sort of these networks of institutions. And I see sort of two things going on. You may have a, a stu- an individual student that's looking to navigate 
course offerings, for example, at different institutions or go from one institution to the other. And we don't, we collectively don't make that easy right now for a number of, of reasons, technology being one of them. Um, and, and so that's really the student driven, uh, you know, and then what we're seeing is some really incredible network. And I know Penn State University has a number of campuses. Um, and and it's, it's good to talk to you, by the way. Pennsylvania is my home state. Um, wow. I've, I've, I've acclimated to the, the warm, dry weather of Utah now, but, but <laughs> Pennsylvania is still home. But then we see um, uh, networks like UNIT in, in the Nordics, where uh, all of these institutions are, are, are utilizing Canvas or the OEI initiative in California, where there's 114 community colleges that are utilizing Canvas sort of across that network. Um, and it's really pushing us to change and define how do we support systems like that. Um, I think there's a lot more that we can do. But what's interesting is we look at some of these systems in the Nordics, for example, in California, they're looking to create sort of new efficiencies and more of a frictionless experience for the student while also trying to optimize resources. So how could a student, for example, in California, you know, build either sort of towards a degree or, or navigate down a pathway towards, you know, a credential or a set of stackable credentials where it's, it's completely seamless for them to access the best course offerings um, across multiple uh, institutions within that network. Um, and so th these are the types of problems that we're working with these organizations to try and sort of support and solve. Um, from a Canvas perspective, there's a few things I think we can do to make it more, more frictionless, and these are things on, on our to-do list. One is um, to, to make data more interoperable, sort of across sort of those, those you know, institutional networks. Uh, the second thing mm -hmm. is, you know, as we've moved more into the e-portfolio realm, um, we acquired a company called Portfolium earlier this year, we really see that e-portfolio having the potential to be a longitudinal vehicle that can be communi communicated and transferable sort of from institution to institution, owned and driven by the individual student. and. We've even gotten a lot of requests over the past months to think about transcripts in a new way. So this could be a vehicle that helps with uh, universities and colleges looking at, at uh, uh, applicants in different ways, but also people mm -hmm. sort of navigating these systems. So in summary, I think, you know, understanding how we can better technically support uh, within a network and then support students as they're trying to navigate different experiences sort of across networks. Well, what a rich answer, Dan. Thank you. And uh, David, great question. Great question. Please uh, enjoy the uh, end of uh, Pennsylvania summer for us. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions that are piling in, friends. And if you're new to the forum, what we just did uh, with David, uh, bringing him on stage like that, that's how a video question works. It's pretty easy to do. Um, speaking of which, let me just add another fellow. Uh, we now have Ray Garcelon. Um, Ray, greetings. How's it going? Heard and seen. Hey, yes. Ray. Good See and hear you. I uh, saw your. Uh, I was at uh, uh, Long Beach. Saw your, your uh, keynote, and uh, been at ASU in the transition from another LMS. So I, I asked, inquire with this. I'm pretty hopeful because of what I've seen. Um, all the requests and changes that are made. Three weeks now, four weeks, um, but specifically what I had brought up. Uh, through the text was, um, so frame it this way, uh, rich content editors haven't changed much in 20 years yeah. uh, in LMSs, but they have changed um, in other web creation, cloud-based tools, you're seeing the, the WordPress has changed. But I, I thought, my, I guess my question is, is there a strategy for richer content and more um, granular, articulate um, changes within Canvas? Because I could see two strategies. I could see either a, a remake of what modern web uh, creation tools are using within Canvas, or again, I was at InstructorCon and there was a, a pretty uh, lively session about the new LTI. And so would integration of tools that can be more rich be more the way that you think Canvas will go mm. um, to improve mm. content creation? I'm not sure which, if there's a plan that's gonna be more successful yeah, so, so Ray, I, I mean, one of the, the unique and, and sometimes challenging situations for us uh, um, being an LMS provider is we, we need to be considerate of both, 
right? What are the capabilities we provide for, for uh, creating content and how do we evolve those capabilities? Um, we actually have on our roadmap a number of, of uh, features and, and, and solutions that will continue to enhance our rich content editor. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we started to talk about that a little bit in some of the breakout sessions in InstructureCon, but, but it's a recognized need for us to continue to involve that. In the same respect, um, there's a lot of incredible tools out there. And then there's also content creators, I mean, you know, publishers and others that are creating content. And so the way we're looking at the strategy right now is quite broad because we, we want to make sure we're inclusive of all of the different players that are generating content, whether it's self-generated, you know, professionally, OER, you know, whatever that content may be. And so for us in our strategy, we want to provide tools for institutions that gives you a lot more creativity and sort of being able to generate content at speed. Um, mm. And we're also really thinking through and working through what are a set of tools that can not only serve the institution, but can serve the broader set of content creators out there in the world, whether it be sort of large publishers or smaller content niche content creators. So I'd say that's really the two prongs of our strategy, in, in, incorporate more features and capabilities in sort of the, 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 the rich content editor within, within Canvas, but also build into more uh, integrations, not just sort of the advanced LTI, but also sort of broader integrations and APIs uh, with Canvas, which many of our, our partners use today. Okay, yeah. yeah. And of course, the third prong is learning analytics, which is more important, to, and I know, so it's hard enough just any one of those prongs, but all three, that, and it, whatever great content comes in, I know the importance of analytics that was stated and restated at InstructureCon and among others. It has yeah. to be along with that, those other two prongs, so. It is. More than it, 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 uh, just a quick comment on that, you know, as you probably saw it in StructureCon, we announced and we've released, at least in beta, um, new analytics offerings already included into Canvas. So you've seen you know, course analytics, student analytics, um, you know, usage analytics as well, which has been a big request. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work around data. Um, and, and, and it's funny, I talked to, talk to a number of people around data and, and what I always say is um, there will never be a time when we are sort of done with data and analytics and insights. And so it's an exciting thing for us because we're, we're continuing to pursue things that add value to teachers and to students, but there's an endless set of opportunities uh, to do that. Um, we have an incredible group of about 20 institutions, academic institutions that work very closely with in, in, in partnership with us right now, helping us to define that roadmap for analytics and data. So, you know, hopefully all of you are, are sort of confident that we're getting very good, real um, institution feedback that is shaping our roadmap today. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank well, you. great to be at the Canvas School now. Good stuff, and you guys, by the way, ASU, you guys now have the Slack Canvas integration. I got yeah. the note today, it's, we yes. just uh, put a bow on that, and that's hopefully, you know, knock on wood, working really well for you as well. So that's another example of where we wanna have really good communication frameworks. It's ramping up, yep, definitely. Yeah. Very well. good. Thank you for the question, Ray. Thank you. And uh, Dan, you, you remind me of uh, scholarly publishers these days when you're talking about um, uh, uh, your data, uh, and data is, is central. Um, we had a question from Beth. Beth, uh, it, we can beam you up, but we'll uh, have you turn your camera on um, so, that, uh, so that we can see your smiling face too. Um, we uh, have a question coming from uh, Bob Nash. And Bob can't be on video, but I can read this question out loud. And this is an important one. What can Canvas do, if anything, to improve equity in the online classroom to better serve and support disadvantaged or underrepresented student populations? Wow. So, so Bob, it's good to, to see you virtually again. Um, and and I, I thank you for, for uh, joining us uh, on, in previous uh, events and initiatives as well. Um, and, and thanks to uh, OEI because you're, you're – a huge supporter as well as uh, throw down lots of challenges for instructure and Canvas as well. You, you know, um, in terms of underserved and disadvantaged populations, this is something that's always been in, in, in the mission of what we want to help support uh, with, with instructure in terms of give back, corporate social responsibility and creating experiences that are inclusive. Things like accessibility are, are always a high priority for us. So mm -hmm. we, there's a list of some, some um, non-negotiable sort of technology design principles that we have around Canvas and everything we do in education. And one of them is really having a high level of, 
of accessibility embedded in our in our applications. Um, you know, if I expand the question more broadly, and maybe where you're going is, you know, how do we reach some of those populations as as, as well that may not have as immediate access to technology, or you know, logistically, it's more difficult to sort of you know work within that that classroom or even online environment. Um, we're continuing to explore options um, in terms of how we can support that. Utah State University is actually a very good example. We work with Utah State very closely. They've built an entire facility, entire uh, approach around accessing broad populations across Utah State um, of, of every type. And in fact, part of the, the money they get from the state is really there to support broad access uh, to education to the point where they have they have different styles of classrooms for different types of students, both virtually online as well as, yeah. as in the classroom where someone who is maybe working online is, is working almost as seamlessly with the people on site as well. And they've created these pods and different video capabilities. And then they've gone as far as to have mobile classrooms as well, where they'll drive a mobile classroom out into a, a remote area of Utah where there may not be a strong internet co connectivity or technology availability. So these are all things that we we work on and we love these types of projects, by the way. So if any of you have ideas on, on um, populations that are, are, are having difficulty accessing education or disadvantaged or, or underprivileged populations where we can help, uh, that would be really awesome. One more mention on this one, which is important mm. and, and it's close to, 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 to my heart as well, is um, in the, the younger years, we're focused a lot on uh, foster children now. We have a new initiative oh. that one of our employees is very passionate about in terms of helping create continuity of the educational experience for foster children as they sort of go to different homes and they have these these fragmented educational experiences and we can use canvas to help those students sort of transition in these non uh, uh, regular points of, of academic transition to maintain continuity and not lose progress so we're always looking for opportunities to support uh, different populations in different ways well, we had a, a that's a terrific answer and just building on that quickly we had a question from someone splendidly named brian i'm not sure who that is um, who says, uh, what are some examples of infrastructure in or anybody else making post-secondary education available in rural communities that don't have a college or university campus? And in in you rural communities. Rural communities. Rural communities. Oh, rural. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, so I gave the example of, of, um, Utah State. of Utah State is a great example of one as well. Um, you know, I, 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 there's also some examples uh, where we're working with an organization in Canada right now, which is providing sort of education for all um, mm. and creating great accessibility of online programs. Um, we also see some of the post-secondary educational resources um, being structured in, in more digestible uh, ways um, that are accessible to people that may mm -hmm. uh, not just be sort of geographically challenged, but it also may be just time challenged. And so what time do they have to be able to spend and access yeah. information? So we're doing an initiative in Canada right now that both touches on that geographic element as well as the, the, mm -hmm. um, the time element. And then there, we're working with some, we're starting to work with some global organizations as well with some sort of, you know, some world health topics and some other educational topics. There's an initiative that we're working on with um, the UN and UNESCO around world, world health training, population training and others. So there's a whole spectrum of how do we reach different populations. Um, one of my big priorities is actually understanding that the the audience for us as an organization and thinking about LMSs and the power of what we can do is not just about the, you know, a couple hundred thousand sort of students that, that are privileged enough to, to be part of school systems and universities that have this technology infrastructure and in LMSs today, but there's 1.5 billion students out there in the world. And so that's the frame that I think of when I think about education is how can we really serve the broader population in, in unique ways and do that, that at scale? Um, not an easy problem to solve, but you know, it's, we're very lucky to be part of education, which is a truly global, um, you know, you know, global industry, if you will, where, you know, it's universal, everybody, you know, understands education and everyone should have access uh, to education no matter where you are. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, Brian, that's a great question. And, um, Thank you, Dan, for the very rich answer. Uh, it's going to be hard for you to fade in the background with this global reach. 
Yeah. Um, we have a question from Shannon Leftwich, uh, Columbia College. Shannon, you need to uh, turn off or turn on your mic. I think you've muted yourself. This is actually Benjamin, um, my coworker Shannon. I'm using her account. Oh, hello. Hello, hello, both of you. Hello. Um, my question is about video. Um, I know you have recently improved uh, Canvas Studio, which used to be called Arc. Um, yep. That's something I'm going to be having the pri privilege of testing myself in a couple weeks. Great. Um, can you talk more about how you see video playing a role and within that accessibility for video captions, audio descriptions, um, and how Canvas is responding with the new um, web content accessibility guidelines? Um, in what ways, I guess, you see involving accessibility in media in one within the platform? Yeah, so, so we have a, a group of people on our team that focus on accessibility and our agenda there, and we have, a, we have a dedicated team. So they're probably the best to get in sort of the details. Um, that team actually monitors sort of the evolving, uh, not only, you know, monitoring sort of the evolving standards and approaches for accessibility, but they actually participate in a lot of uh, uh, groups defining sort of the new model for accessibility and what we need to pay attention to. Um, mm. the studio is actually um, an interesting, we first came to market with ARC, which is now branded studio. Um, as you know, accessibility was a, a big sort of challenge and we said, how do we handle that? So one of that is the captioning, which you may be familiar with where, you know, we, we've invested in um, auto generation of captioning in, in a variety of languages. Um, the other thing that we found with accessibility and evolving the standards, not only for video, but for a lot of the digital interactions throughout is um, we have a deep partnership with, uh, with Microsoft. Microsoft has some incredible access accessibility tools that they've built, built in, like the interactive reader. And so what you'll see very soon in Canvas uh, within the next couple months is we're doing deep integration work with Microsoft where all of their accessibility suite and like the interactive reader will be available natively in Canvas. So think of it as anywhere you have text in Canvas, you'll actually be able to use things like the interactive reader. So we're going deeper than just sort of, sort of you know, um, the, the sort of the visual and audio uh, enablement of accessibility. We're going into lots of different um, types of accessibility and what's going to help an individual with whatever um, you know challenge they may have to to sort of navigate and be able to con consume con content in different ways. So you, there'll be more innovations in Studio. The other topic with Studio that's really important for us, that's a hot topic, is um, uh, security and access uh, to video as well. Um, this is a big thing that we've worked on. Is if you're using um, videos from YouTube, for example, or using third party source videos, how do we do the best job we can in, in creating an avenue for students to access sort of videos that become part of the curriculum, but it doesn't create a gateway to things that may be inappropriate or off topic or whatever. And that's another initiative that we have going on is to make sure that we can utilize online resources, but also do them in a secure way. Well, that's a rich answer. Uh, thank you, Shannon. And thank you. I didn't get your name. Benjamin. Benjamin, great. So Benjamin, Benjamin actually, Benjamin. if you're just starting with Studio, if you want, if you would do me a favor, uh, send me an email in a few weeks or give me a call and let me know how things are going. I always love getting feedback, so please, please, uh, please keep me posted. Well, thank you for the question. That's really, really nice of you to uh, to say, Dan, and uh, and you're getting a lot of feedback today. Um, uh, speaking of feedback, we have a detailed question from Beth. Um, Beth Havocs at Delamar College. She says that she works in an online tutoring center using Canvas. We write comments to students on their quizzes. Canvas would integrate better if the links we send could be live. Um, is that possible? Can Canvas mm. make that happen? Um, do you know what? I need to look into that. But Beth, it's a really great question. Um, so let me let me look into that and get back to you. If you wouldn't mind sort of sending me an email or an update, my email is simply dan at instructure.com. I'd love to be able to correspond with you and, and make sure I can answer your, your question accurately. And if it's something we can't do today that's really important, um, it's something that I hope we'll be able to do, you know, very, very soon support to support those needs. Um, by the way, on this note, tutoring and advising is a big priority for us as well. One of the questions that we get a lot is, is when working with advisors or tutors, you know, creating the ability in Canvas to be able to look at groups of students or students, a student across courses and really understand sort of the full picture and portrait of a student is a priority that we're hearing more and more, um, especially as we look at 
um, these innovation schools that are creating sort of these, these pathways for students that are very individualized um, and they're working in, in more of that advisor or tutoring model. So that's a priority on our roadmap as well. So, you know, you should all stay tuned. There's going to be more to come around supporting really solid tutoring and advisoring models, both at the K-12 and higher ed level. Oh, great. Great, great question. Great question. Uh, speaking of technical questions, we have a, another really great technical question. Um, let me flash this one on the screen. This is from Karen N at UC San Diego. If there's additional information about the Slack integration in Canvas, please let us know. I'd love to explore that LTI. That's another awesome. Slack fiend, Karen. Good. So, Brian, what's the best? These are great questions. What's the best way for me to, to follow up on these questions and make sure we get information back to this group? Because well, I think that's really important. There's a couple of ways. Uh, one is we could do a, a follow-up event, if you like, depending on your schedule. The other is I can post these as um, – I can email you these questions, and then I can post the answers as a blog post. Um, so that uh, you know that'll be available, and then I can share the URL for that with uh, everybody involved. Perfect. No, I appreciate that, Brian, and be happy to follow up on this. Now, regarding stat Slack specifically, and then broader communication, just a couple comments. So we've done some really innovative work with ASU, and to give Slack credit as well, you know, it was really the Slack and Instructure teams coming together with with ASU providing a lot of the requirements and inspiration around the experience that they wanted to create where we invested in our, our integrations uh, with Slack. So those things can be easily available. Um, I'll provide more information out to this, this group on, on how uh, you can leverage more of those um, communication platforms and the integration of those. <sighs> communication, by the way, is another area where uh, we, we see a lot of change. And this is an area where, as, as in structure with Canvas, we're trying to figure out what our role is. Um, because the communication avenues and the network of communication within the uh, in an institution with students uh, with with educators is is much broader than just sort of the learning experience or, or the LMS so this is something where we've deliberately sort of worked on integrations with slack uh, with team from teams from from Microsoft for example uh, with um, uh, with remind we have a great uh, integration uh, with remind and a handful of others as well to make sure that we can plug into these really incredible communication tools. But there's really a balance that we're trying to figure out between what kind of communications and groups should happen within Canvas, maybe enabled by a Slack or others, and which kind of communication sort of should happen uh, seamlessly in these broader networks of communications, whether it be Slack or Teams. Well, that's a really detailed answer um, for another technical question. Uh, we have uh, another video question uh, coming up. Let's bring uh, Elizabeth Elmore. Uh, Elizabeth, we need your camera on for that. It should be on. Okay, I'm just seeing a black square. It's, a, it's either really dark or there's a camera issue. Um, it is, it's probably really dark. Let me see if I can. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hi, Elizabeth, Hello. how are you? Hello. I had a tab across it. Uh, oh. I guess I have two questions that are sort of related. I work at an institution that uses Blackboard. Great. And okay. I haven't been courageous enough to use Canvas, although I hear wonderful things about it, because they tell us we're on our own if we use Canvas. So okay. what sort of, if I could adopt Canvas as just one faculty member, what kind of support do you provide for people like me? Well, um... So we have a 24 by 7 sort of, you know, really strong support organization. Um, so, you know, we love to support people with Canvas. We also have a free for teacher offering, which will help give you sort of support if you're an individual teacher uh, utilizing Canvas. Um, and we'd be happy to, to help give you support along those lines as well. It's not uncommon, by the way, for an institution such as yours where they may say, hey, we have a standard, but we allow a number of different capabilities out there. So what I would recommend, Elizabeth, is um, we have, if you go on instructure.com uh, or, or our Canvas website, you can download and, and, and or you can click and access our free for teacher uh, there and start utilizing uh, Canvas. And, you know, you can, you can access our support and ask questions and all sorts of other things as well. And that's a great way to start to get to know Canvas. Um, and you know, see what see what you think, and hopefully it supports you in the in, in what well, you need. As I said, I, some faculty have been using it for years, but I haven't been 
courageous enough to do it. I am now using Remind. Yeah. One of uh, one of the faculty told told me about Remind. Uh, we no longer in Blackboard. They are using now Zoom. We've gotten rid of the Blackboard Collaborate, and now that yep. Zoom is part of it. Okay, well that's good. My other question: uh, We we are working in Atlantic City now. We have a campus in Atlantic City, and mm -hmm. one of my concerns is that there are many kids who don't have access to computers outside of their school building. And you, you were talking about a mobile classroom how, do, how does that do you actually put a trailer somewhere and then so so yeah so i mean that's not in structure that does that we support it with sort of the software and the technology but utah state for example has mobile trailers and they have mobile classrooms where they'll literally drive to rural areas and provide access to technology so that's really sort of a collaboration between okay. us and utah state so it's okay. not in structure that provides that in what i'm sorry what was the last thing you said yeah it's not in structure that provides for the mobile uh, trailer, okay. but it's because the university. I, yeah. I have read read about schools who um, use school buses as sort yeah. of a mobile classroom to allow um, internet access. All right. Yeah. So, all right. We work, that, yeah, Elizabeth, and we do work with a number of organizations that are providing sort of internet access more broadly for free. Um, and we have uh, mobile apps as well. So that's the other thing. We actually have a large number of students that utilize our mobile app. And so if they don't have a computer that they have access to all the time, sometimes individuals have access to a mobile device and that can help with the experience too. Well, these people probably don't have access to a mobile device. Okay. But, all right, so maybe I'll send you a private email and you can give me the names of those organizations that work with this. I've tried to find find it through Verizon or AT&T. Um, or Xfinity, but I haven't I haven't found it yet. What yeah. they what they would do? Yeah, please send me an email, and I'd be happy to to help make connections okay. where we can to support that need. Well, our semester starts on Tuesday, so I I will use this cool. semester as a way to learn about Canvas for the spring. Perfect. Just in time learning. That's right. Just in time learning. Yes, J I T L. All right. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck, Elizabeth, and thank, thank you for you. the question. Um, we have. Um, uh, we're, first, we're running out of time. We're coming at 10 minutes before the hour, uh, and you've been asking a bunch of terrific questions. We'd like to we'd like to end the session by thinking about the future, and a few people out there help us think so well about the future is Tom Hames uh, from Houston, a longtime friend of the program. Uh, Tom, you're in a blue mode, I can see. I'm usually in a blue mode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, well, crack out it's, of that. It's called the paint in my walls. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I wanted to hearken back to what Brian was asking about earlier. Um, you know, you can see a direct line in the way in the evolution of LMSs for the last 20 plus or more years. Um, and in many ways, um, what we're doing collectively as institutions and the LMS providers is trying to mimic uh, formulas and ideas that work in the physical world, in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. Um, Brian, about 10 years ago when his beard was a little bit less gray, uh, introduced me to this concept of uh, paradigms of technology. And then in the first paradigm, you are basically um, copying the existing modality, but making it better and more efficient. But it doesn't really change the way you work. And it's only when you get to the second paradigm that you start to, where the, where the technology changes society. I mean, think about the car going from the horseless carriage to the automobile and the, the impact that, that has had on, our, on the 20th century, for instance. Um, so what I wanted to see if I could get you to cogitate on, and, and there's a couple of ways you could think about this, is that, you know, where where is this step for the LMS? I mean, I think we haven't really explored what online learning can do because we have been tied too much to this old educational paradigm. Um, and I see this repeated all in all. And a lot of the issues you're talking about are very important functional issues, but they're building on existing problems. You're solving problems. I get that. Yeah. Um, the other way to ask the question is, which company is going to come along and disrupt Canvas right? yeah. in structure? And I, I, I hope you guys are having those discussions, but uh, um, uh, I'm curious what you have to say on that. I'll let you talk. Yeah. 
So, so uh, great questions, and, and I agree with you. And by the way, I've been a technologist for over 25 years. Um, you know, I've been there at the dawn of client client server computing, moving to thin client, moving to to cloud computing, and now the various horizons of cloud as it's gone through definitions of ASP to process orchestration to sort of data clouds as well. And I, you know, I think we'll continue to see technology paradigm shifts open up opportunities to support the current modality and, and model for different industries, not just, just education as well. And my last uh, company before Instructure, um, we evolved to, to uh, through a very similar uh, process and, and evolution. I, I, there's, a, there's a couple challenges, I think, with, with organizations such as Instructure um, in, in moving forward to that sort of second horizon, if you will, where you're moving from supporting the existing model of the way things are done to being a partner in innovating and changing and evolving the model. And it's a very hard thing. Um, and there, there's a few things I think that are challenging. One is, does, does an organization like Instructure have the DNA, frankly, to innovate? Um, are we an innovative company or have we just sort of used the new cloud technology paradigm to support the way teaching has been done and, you know, for, for some time and done today? And that's a very existential question for us, but it's something that, that we contemplate a good bit. You know, some of the things that I've talked about from time to time is over the last decade with Canvas, we've supported and we've helped to sort of create more of that digital frictionless sort of classroom and classroom experience. But looking forward, you know, we're going to have to really partner to innovate because the innovations of the next 10 years that will really move the needle to, to, to your point are things that don't exist today. We can't look at the patterns of today and just, just apply technology. Mm -hmm. Now, for a lot of technology companies, there's risk in doing that. So it's not just a DNA problem, but there's a risk in doing that as well. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in the whole concept of, of, of disruptive innovation. If you look at Clayton Christensen, how he's, he's talked about the innovator's dilemma, um, I, I believe there are going to be some things over the next five to 10 years where we'll have to sort of disrupt what we've done over the last 10 years and say, you know, we're going to break these things that we've done in the past so we can get through to that, that new innovation. You know, the, the other big challenge, I think, which is a universal, universal challenge for all of us is how do we not only identify new ways of doing things that, that generate um, beneficial results, but do them at scale? Um, because there, there's, there's definitely an ecosystem of education that um, is hard to move and change. There was this great, um, there was this great program on PBS. I don't think it's on the air anymore called Connections. I don't know if you mm -hmm. remember this yeah, thing called cool. Connections, but one of my favorite examples is they, they would, they would start with sort of a question and then they'd go back in time to understand, you know, the, these, these, these questions or these, these connections. And um, the, uh, the, I remember one of these shows said, why are the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle the width that they are? Hmm. And then they'd say, well, they are the width they are because of the Roman chariots. And they go through this whole like connection process saying, well, you know, what it boils down to is the, the solid ro rocket boosters are the size they are because they have to drive them down certain roads to be able to get them to the launch pad, which means they can only be a certain width or they'll knock into trees and other things. And the roads we have today are the size they are because of a number of progressions where the Roman chariots, when roads were created, you know, you know sort of yeah. set that standard. And so, you know, I give that example because in any industry, and especially in an industry as, as pervasive and broad as education, and as long as education, how do we together break through those paradigms and understand mm -hmm. the effort mm -hmm. it takes to sort of change from those, those, um, those constraints that we've, we've lived within? Um, now, I believe in Structure's role in that is to be a partner and supporter, and we want to try and inspire innovation and change and it should be a partner in experimentation. Um, but, but I don't think that we solely will sort of define or drive, you know, what education looks like over the, the next 10 years. So you'll see us even more active out there in the community working with a lot of organizations. Your last question very quickly, let me address that. Um, you know, I, I've been through this cycle. Uh, in, in a lot of technology areas, there's, there's a cycle of, of technology leadership that goes over and over in these sort of eight to 13 year cycles. Hmm. And the reason why sort of companies may rise to popularity and then fall from popularity very quickly is because they stop innovating. And stop innovating means you stop investing. 
Um, and so that's something that's very important to me is that we don't stop investing in Canvas and the things, all the things that we're doing. We maintain that commitment. Uh, we we are bringing on more engineers and product people into into our organization into Canvas than we ever have in the history of Instructure. So I think the best thing that we can do moving forward to continue to um, to hold all of your trust and, and provide what you need in in, the, in in education is to continue to listen and continue to sort of invest in what we're doing and not become complacent. Uh -oh. Good answers on that. I mean, I, I, those those are very thoughtful, and I do appreciate that. It's it's tough because I mean the the establishment is very conservative. There are things pulling institutions in certain directions around expectations, around grading and assessment, and all these other things, which raise a whole host of issues that you have to uh, to manage. But uh, it's yeah. it's yeah. I, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, there's there's an opportunity for instructor to help sort of gradually pull the, the giant cement block a little further down the road and some of that oh. stuff. And it seems like you're, you're, you're talking about that. So yeah, we're, we're trying. And I do think, um, you know, when you look at online and sort of these frictionless integrated experiences, you know, that will set a new foundation for what we can do. Um, and, you know, how do we create these experiences that are not designed but delightful in mm -hmm. what we have and they're surprising? Um, and that's really the hard part, architecting those experiences. And right. they can happen. You know, the other thing that's important when we think about design principles is not every innovation has to be big. Um, I'll never forget the, um, there used to be a service, I'm sure mm -hmm. so many of you aware, there used to be this service where you call 411 information to get a phone number for something. Mm -hmm. And I'd, mm -hmm. I'd call 411, there, there's a, a period of time where I'd call 411, I'd say, hey, uh, what is the phone number for this restaurant or what is the phone number for, you know, this hardware store? And I remember one day I called the phone number like I normally do. I called for one. I said, um, hey, could I get the phone number for this restaurant? And the person responded to me and said, well, here's the phone number. Would you like me to make a reservation? And it sounds it sounds so simple, but it blew my mind at the time. I said, I never thought that was possible. I never expected that. So I think that's part of our challenge too, is just creating these experiences that are unexpected, add a lot of value, but not try and do things that are so overblown or massive. You know, sometimes it's these small things that make a big difference. Right. Just one real quick thing I want to throw in there as far as uh, change. You know, when you're talking about content creation earlier, uh, don't forget the students. I mean, my class is now yeah. completely turned around to where the students are doing 90% of the content creation in my, in my government class, not, not me. And I'm yeah. just guiding them along the way and helping them with, with, with their creation of their own content. And the platforms need to do a better job, I think, of supporting so, that kind of thing. So, Tom, I'd love, to yeah. follow up. I'd love to follow up on this one with you because yeah. one of the biggest challenges we actually see, and maybe all of you can help with this, is sort of adoption and utilization by instructors. And I, I look at this, it's interesting. I take a lot of cues on the future of technology in the world from my three daughters. They're, they're 15, 12, and 10. They're, they're amazing. They're going to take over the world, and I'm very biased. But, um, <laughs> but you know, what, what's fascinating is, and they're all Canvas users, um, and it's fascinating to me. One of my 12-year-old my, my last year, she said to me, she said, Dad, you know what? I have three types of teachers. I have teachers that use Canvas all the time, and I can trust everything in Canvas and what they're doing. I have cool. teachers that don't use Canvas at all, and that's not great, but that's okay. And then I have some teachers that sort of use Canvas, and it creates a lot of stress for me. It's very hard for me because I don't know what to trust. I don't know whether I'm missing something. Cool. And so it, it's this interesting um, concept. And then I see her, you know, I see my daughters really networking and communicating with other students to provide resources and help each other and support their studies. So one of the ideas actually we, we have in Canvas is could we create tools where students could effectively, you know, crowdsource or, or author or create content into, into a course that would be helpful to that sort of, you know, uh, class as a community. So yeah, Tom, I'd love to follow up and hear how you, you've done that with your class. Thank I'm happy you. to happy to talk to you about that. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, we we are running over, but we have time for one great question um, from Ophelia Mangan at Columbia. Uh, Ophelia, you've been awfully patient, and we're really really glad to hear from you. Please, please let us know your question. Hi, Brian. Thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about sort of the opt-in and opt-out sort of cultures, right? Um, I kind of have been referring to it as the sort of era 
of uninformed consent. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. um, and then sort of on the other side, a couple of people mentioned the resources that are available for individual instructors and what you know Canvas and Instructure are doing to provide direct support to them. And when I, you know, a lot of the work that I do is sort of in that in-between space and making sure to connect people to the things that they need in the way that they need it. Um, speaking of, <laughs> someone coming in for my three o'clock, and I'm sure she'll be happy to wait just a moment. Um, but uh, so my question to you, and, and if we don't have time for you to answer this, maybe you could follow up, you know, at some another space and share thoughts with us, is that what are, what do you, what's your perspective on the role of institutions and individual instructors when it comes to the responsible use of the LMS. And I'm thinking specifically about accessibility, um, you know, and the learning curve there. There's a lot for people to unlearn, a lot for them to learn in order to be able to provide inclusive learning environments for students, both on a technical level and otherwise, right? And then also learning systems data, you know, with someone with the best of intentions, right? Who is not, you know, used to making use of data in quantitative formats, for example, or um, you know, doesn't know how to sort of unpack and realize what that is telling them about an individual student. Again, lots to unlearn yeah. and lots to learn. Uh, so you know, just again, from the, the position that you hold and the company that holds such an important position in this space, um, your thoughts on, on what you know, institutions' roles are to yeah. do that. No, I feel I appreciate the, the questions. I think the first one is really, you, you said sort of accessibility and responsible use of, of the LMS. Um, and and I, if I can maybe try and interpret that question a little bit, it feels like that's sort of the how to, how to utilize LMSs in, in the most universal, accessible way and in the most productive way that's sort of serving the instructor, serving the, 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 the student as well. Um, and then what resources are there to, to support that too? Um, you know, I, I, it's an interesting challenge, and I think it's a universal challenge for for all universities as, as well as students. Um, I think it's also the type of thing where I've seen students uh, become very, very proficient, and they have a, a set of expectations for what they're going to get out of technology and the LMS as well. And sometimes that I've even seen that create a divide between um, the instructor's view of the use of technology and what the student expectations are. And so I think there's some really good example of institutions that are doing a good job both in professional development for instructors as well as support resources for instructors as well, whether they come from Instructure or whether they mm -hmm. come from the organization. Probably one of the best examples, I'll give a K-12 example, is OCPS in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, they have a massive um, um, faculty base that is distributed across many schools. Um, they have certain curriculum standards they want to apply. They also want to have creativity in their curriculum. And they have a variety of instructors that have various levels of, of comfort, confidence, and sort of usage of, of the LMS. Um, and they've created a central team that is doing sort of adoption management with each of these schools. They're going into the schools. They're working with the instructors. They're creating these peer connections with sort of these super users. Um, to make sure that the LMS can really provide benefits, not just in general, but to the individual um, instructor as well. Um, and some of that then connects to the data. How, you know, we're implementing a lot of analytics capabilities in Canvas. Pretty much everything we're implementing right now in Canvas for analytics is driven by all of you, all of our customers. Um, and it's, it's great to sort of see that. But one of the things I've noticed with data, and I'll get to the usage question in a second, one of the things I've noticed with data as well is um, there are many institutions out there in the world, not just sort of focused on ac academia, but broader, that sort of throw data over the wall. And I, I think that's responsible. It's irresponsible. Mm. Um, I actually think that providing data, you need to provide data and information in context. You need to provide data and information in a way that's sort of secure and doesn't provide um, uh, risk. And you provide data and information in a way where you're educating the consumers of that of that data as well. Um, we've done a lot of work on things like advising and how do we utilize information to inform different instructors or advisors in, in different ways. And it, it's a it's a different way of operating. So I think there's some education to be done there as well. Now with data and data usage in general, we're very happy that this is becoming a topic of conversation out in the open. Um, and it's creating a lot of you know, heated debate and dialogue right now. We have no timelines on what we're doing with data and analytics and how we're doing things. We're very much taking cues from the community and from our, 
our customers. But the topic of data and data usage, especially at an industry level, is a, to is a topic in just about every industry I can think of right now. And so I think there's a really good healthy dialogue that is evolving in education because it's inevitable that that data is going to be out there and is going to be available. I know of many institutions right now that are utilizing data for students and teachers and others and trying to figure out how to use that in the best possible way. So I think the best thing we can do right now is to, to really have a rich and open and transparent dialogue and ask those hard questions, but also not do things in haste where we could make mistakes and, and cause risk, especially when we're dealing with, with students. So I know that maybe is not as a very specific answer, but it's something we're gonna solve and, and navigate together. Dan, that's a fantastic answer. Um, and Ophelia, thank you for the great, great question. Uh, greetings to your uh, three o'clock appointment person too. Um, friends, I, I, I hate to wrap this up because we've been going a great, great torrent of information and questions and thought, but we are just past the end of our hour and we really do have to, uh, to wrap things up. Um, Dan, let me just thank you so much for uh, for all of your comments, your willingness to engage so thoroughly with everybody. I'm, I'm really, really impressed. Thank you very much. Um, if people want to reach you and keep up with your work, uh, is Dan uh, at Instructure.com the best way? So, uh, yeah, uh, that's my direct email address. It will come to my, my inbox and at risk of getting inundated with lots of questions and requests. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to sort of take that on. Um, I, I wanna thank everyone from joining today and asking some, some really great questions. I'm sad that we don't have some more time to continue the, the dialogue and maybe even flip it around where I could ask all of you some questions too. Maybe Brian, that's that a, future, a future future trend yes. uh, um, yes. uh, session. But yeah, you can reach me at Dan at Goldsmith or Dan at uh, instructure.com. And, uh, and, you know, I'd love to hear from all of you, you know, ask questions, give feedback. Um, I also love it if, if there's someone you know from instructure that's doing a great job, I always welcome a sort of pat on the back that I can pass on to some of my team as well. So Brian, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to this group. Well, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Don't go away, friends. Uh, we're going to follow up and try and bring Dan back um, uh, maybe next year. Um, but just let me give you a couple of tips about the next week, uh, what's happening in the forum. And let me also just thank you all very much uh, for really terrific, terrific questions. This has been like a seminar on the state of the LMS and its future. Uh, next week, speaking of the future, we're going to be meeting with Michelle Weiss from Strata Education. Uh, she's going to be talking with us about the reinventing higher education. So please join us for that session. Um, if you'd like to get a recording of this session or dive back into nearly four years of forum sessions, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and you'll be able to dig in. Now, if you'd uh, also don't forget to fill out the survey, uh, tinyurl.com slash forum survey 2019. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and if you'd like to keep talking with social media, we have groups in Facebook, uh, Slack, LinkedIn, and we tweet like mad. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, 